Hello, and welcome to the Carl Zeiss webinar, Strategies for Correlative Microscopy in Biosciences Research. My name is Maya Everett, and I am responsible for the Marketing Communications Group in North America. I would like to thank everyone for joining us today, and I apologize if you tried to join us last week and had difficulties logging in. First, I would like to perform a quick audio check. This is for participants who can see the slides but are not hearing my voice. Hopefully they will read the text and check their audio settings if necessary. Please give me one minute while I confirm with a colleague the quality of the audio. And everything looks okay. If you have any technical problems during this live webinar, we will be emailing a link to, the record, to view the recorded version in one to two business days. I would like to encourage everyone to ask questions. The webinar will run for approximately 45 minutes, with 15 minutes remaining for questions. You can ask a question at any time by typing it into the GoToWebinar chat window, which you can see here on the right. All questions will be saved until the end, and then we will answer as many questions as we can. We will email responses for all unanswered questions to the email address you use to register. You can also send us questions at any time to micro at zeiss.com. And with that, I would like to turn the microphone over to Kirk. Thank you. I thought I would begin by talking a little bit about my background uh, so that you can have an idea of what my experiences were with correlative and uh, uh, microscopy. Currently, I'm the director of the North American Applications and Labs at Carl Zeiss Microscopy. Prior to that, I was an associate professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at the University of Delaware, and I also directed the University of Delaware Bioimaging Center for about 16 years. Uh, before then, I was an application scientist uh, at NOR Instruments, the confocal business unit, as well as a postdoc at the DuPont Company uh, in the uh, plant molecular genetics group, and uh, my PhD was received in the Department of Botany and Plant Pathology at Michigan State University. I have 25 years of advanced microscopy experience in uh, most forms of microscopy and optical and electron, and I have had a special emphasis on developing and applying cutting-edge microscopy tools for imaging cells, tissues, and soft materials, especially using correlative microscopy. So uh, I wanted to provide a quick note here that this is a biosciences-focused webinar. We will host an additional webinar for correlative microscopy with, for material scientists uh, samples in about five to six weeks, and we'll send out a notice when that's uh, um, ready to be announced. I thought it would be worth talking a little bit about the agenda today of what I'm going to discuss. First, I thought it was worthwhile to define what is correlative microscopy, at least to myself, um, and get into a little bit about the probes that you can use for correlative micro microscopy. I would also like to talk about strategies for manual relocation, strategies for tissues, strategies for fluorescent proteins, and automation and workflow using shuttle and find. This segments three through six are actually um, uh, following an evolution of the process that I have applied over the last several years as I've, I've gotten more into the technique. And then uh, towards the end of my talk, I'll be uh, getting into trends in correlative microscopy and some tips and getting started if you're interested in doing this for the first time in your own lab or if you're just at the early stages of using correlative microscopy. So let's begin by what is correlative microscopy? Well, I would define correlative microscopy as a sophisticated approach that combines the imaging capabilities of typically separate but powerful microscopy platforms, often including, but not limited to, optical and electron microscopy. And I would note at this point, many of you may already be familiar with the term CLEM, which stands for Correlative Light and Electron Microscopy, which is commonly used uh, um, uh, by the biosciences field and will be the primary focus of this uh, webinar. I want to bring out, um, uh, um, point out this example image here is one of the more complex experiments that I've used for, for correlative microscopy. And the idea being that correlative microscopy has many, 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 many different approaches to get uh, um, back and forth between the instruments and uh, different probe approaches. Today's webinar will primarily be focused on sharing my experiences over the last several years to perhaps shorten your uh, learning curve if you are considering uh, applying correlative microscopy in your own laboratory. This example up here is actually uh, a correlative confocal uh, image overlaid onto a scanning electron microscope image. And we had uh, samples that were GFP labeled bacterium called Pseudomonas, uh, 
that we wanted to see if it was triggering the uh, stomatal apertures to open or close uh, as it made contact with the surface of the leaf or whether it was actually getting inside of the leaf first and causing the aperture to close. And by using fluorescence live cell imaging, we were able to capture this uh, image with our confocal microscope and then use correlative microscopy to get back to the same location by scanning electron micros microscopy after freezing the sample first and uh, then imaging it uh, subsequently. I want to point out that this is definitely one of the more complex experiments that I've performed in trying to relocate a sample and I think what you'll learn today is uh, many of the more basic ways to get at it first before you start attempting this type of approach. So why would I use correlative microscopy or why do I use correlative microscopy? Um, I actually use it for three primary reasons. Number one is it provides me different information. It allows me to look at the same exact structure uh, using both fluorescence and electron microscopy in the examples of CLEM. For example, uh, if you're using a fluorescence microscope, such as a confocal or a light microscope, you often can see two to three different probes at the same time. However, you don't get a lot of other information about the rest of the cell's uh, internal structure. Um, you're typically limited to just a handful of probes. While if you can go to the electron microscope for that same exact location, you can then see virtually every organelle, microtubules, vesicles, Golgi body, uh, Golgi apparatus, uh, plasma membrane, endoplasmic reticulum, all in one single shot. So the value of having both of those information at the same time on a particular project, I think, is extremely useful. The second reason I use uh, correlative microscopy is to find rare or targeted structures for specific phenomena in cells, tissues, and materials. And I would give you the example if you were targeting uh, uh, the cell cycle, in particular mitosis, and you wanted to actually look at um, a, a phenomena that's occurring at the metaphase plate, it wouldn't be an efficient way to just randomly section through uh, blocks or tissues uh, by electron microscopy to locate those structures. You can use correlative microscopy to identify the specific stage you're interested in, target that particular cell, and go to the EM level um, at the correct orientation and time point that you're interested in. The third reason that I use correlative microscopy is to put things in the context. You can rapidly screen and locate and image large fields of view using standard photon-based optics, and then subsequently move to high-resolution technologies to re reveal the subcellular ultrastructural details at a nanoscale of resolutions. And if you think about it this way, if you're typically using electron microscopy uh, to image samples, I, I'm often using maybe, uh, looking at an area, maybe a few 50, 10 to 50 microns in size on the electron microscope. Well, uh, the reality is, is that uh, I actually lose perspective of what the rest of the tissue is like. And by using correlative microscopy and light microscopy first, you can actually show that that particular cell that you're interested in targeting um, is in a specific uh, part of, of the uh, um, overall tissue that you're, you're targeting. So what do we mean by putting things in the context? And I like to use Google Maps as an, uh, um, as an example here to help uh, people understand why it's valuable here. So we can identify what this is uh, uh, using Google Maps. It's a forest somewhere on the map. And I, I really think of EM as a similar type of uh, uh, phenomenon. I'm looking at some cell somewhere in some tissue, but sometimes it's difficult uh, uh, to understand exactly where that tissue is in relation to, uh, that cell is in relation to the rest of the tissue. So I would argue that somewhere here is not good enough. Knowing that you have a cell on your, uh, on your, uh, at your high resolution uh, EM image uh, um, is, is not good enough when you think about uh, um, knowing that forest in, in Siberia would have a very different meaning than a forest in the middle of the United States or in South America. So uh, using navigation and correlation, it allows us to know for certainty that that forest is in Lawrence, Kansas. And I like to think about the, the uh, topographical image, much like the electron micro, micrograph and the uh, overlays of the highways and your favorite Starbucks store or your local bank as being the fluorescent images overlaid. And when you think about um, traveling down the highways and having all of that um, additional information inside of the cell, I think it has very high value as well. So let's talk a little bit about a few probes for correlative microscopy. To be honest with you, this is just a very small partial list. And I certainly won't give you uh, um, examples uh, today. We don't have time to go all, over all of them. But if you're already using a few of these techniques, you could probably very, very quickly get into correlative microscopy as long as you have uh, both types of microscopes that are being used. So first, uh, it's very common, at least at the EM level, that you can use colloidal gold um, with or without silver enhancement. Um, there are techniques to sil silver enhance gold particles um, uh, and see them by light microscopy and then move to the EM level.
There's also the ability to use peroxidase, such as a horserad horseradish peroxidase, which will leave a, a precipitate that can be visualized at the end level. DAB, DAB photooxidation, diaminobenzidine photooxidation, can be used for EM. There are lots of different ways of doing that, using um, uh, some fluorescent proteins, um, uh, flash and reash. Um, uh, eosin, uh, Minisog, and Apex. Uh, Minisog and Apex in particular are genetically encoded um, uh, uh, molecules that will uh, form a DAB uh, reactant uh, that you can actually image at the electron microscope level. You can also use the techniques such as quantum dots, which can be dis distinguished both by size and shape at the EM level. Uh, Fluoro nanogold uh, is also a possibility. Uh, this allows you to actually see a small gold particle um, and fluorescence conjugated to the same probe. Uh, silver enhancement is usually recommended when you're using this strategy to go to the EM level. Yet another interesting way of going about correlative microscopy is using dyes such as cyanine and alexa dyes. Uh, some of them are actually compatible with ketol resins, meaning that their fluorescence does not quench, and you can use them through that process. And Bodipi dyes have been shown to work in epoxy resins and maintain their fluorescence. Of course, um, a, a strategy of using N-block autofluorescence, where your tissue may have some native autofluorescence in it, uh, can be used as a strategy to identify structures of interest. And you can also use stains, such as a generic stain, such as acridine orange, which will label the tissues and, and survive through the EM processing. Another area that I like to use correlative uh, uh, for would be reflection imaging of nanoparticles. A lot of researchers were interested in, in, in uh, imaging where these uh, small particles were going inside of cells and, and tissues and how they were interacting. Uh, oftentimes, if the particle is large enough, reflection imaging on a confocal works quite nicely. Fluorescent proteins are also possible to preserve in some resins and has been shown in LR white and LR gold. And then finally, um, just using LR white or any other section of your choice, you can use immunofluorescence on that section and do correlative microscopy. Again, here are just a few examples. There are many other possibilities out there. I wanted to begin uh, to talk about strategies for manual relocation because many of you may not have uh, the opportunity uh, to have an automated uh, solution in your facility. And I wanted to describe how I was doing this uh, probably about 15 or 20 years ago um, using a, a, an objective diamond scribe. And if you look at the picture here, uh, we have a diamond scribe uh, that I uh, was able to purchase on eBay. And it basically uh, is put in your objective turret. And there's a small, sharp pointed diamond at the end. And what you would do is you would actually use uh, maybe a 60x or a 40x or a 100x objective or even a 20x to identify a small structure of interest. Uh, in this particular case, I was looking at fungal pathogens. There were about 5 to 10 microns in diameter invading in a leaf surface. I wanted to be very specific on the stage of the invasion uh, that I was looking at. And so I needed to pre-screen the samples uh, in a flat embedded resin mold. And once I identified where the fungus was, um, I would then uh, um, move my um, traditional objective out of the way, place this uh, diamond scribe over top of the sample, and I would spin uh, the dial on here, and it would actually score a one millimeter diameter um, a ring around the structure of interest. Now, the good news is, is that I was now within one millimeter of my structure of interest, but it was better than randomly sectioning uh, blindly through the material. Once I actually identified and circled this ring, I would uh, clean off any oil, and then I would use a razor blade to cut out the small region, and then I would glue it onto a stub and then continue on through the trimming and, and uh, sectioning process. Um, for those who haven't done flat embedment before, um, uh, it's a very simple technique, whether it's a piece of tissue or cell cultures or even cover slips. Um, a, a very simple way to do this is to get Aclar sheets um, and um, put a small amount of your favorite resin. I use Thermonox spacers as well between it uh, because they were solvent resistant and you can cut them to size. And then a Teflon coated glass slide. Um, you can't, uh, I didn't buy the Teflon coated glass slides uh, um, uh, commercially. I would simply take a glass slide, spray it with the Teflon, let it dry, and then use that as the coating. The reason I coated these glass sides with Teflon is so I could, I could have the little piece of resin that I was cutting out of the block to quickly release from the glass. At the same time, it would allow it to hold enough for me to do um, imaging by light microscopy. You can also use uh, molds uh, that are, um, uh, have a little bit thicker diameter as well. So uh, that was one strategy. And then I moved into the, to the, uh, the um, um, uh, projects where I needed to actually identify cells sitting on a cover slip. And of course, when you look at cells on a cover slip, it often can look at like finding a needle in a haystack if you want to get back to a particular cell. So what I did was I looked through the literature and I found Svetkina and Borisi uh, work where they actually used an EM grid uh, 
um, uh, to, uh, uh, as, as a marker. Um, and I basically said, okay, how about if I take that idea and uh, use an SEM finder grid as a mask? And so commercially, you can get these uh, SEM finder grids. They're about a centimeter in uh, diameter. And you can put them over top of a cover slip. And if you have a carbon coater uh, or a gold palladium or a sputter coater of some type, you can actually coat, uh, uh, do a coating on it while the, the finder grid is sitting on top of the cover slip. And then remove the cover slip, and you have a very, very stable um, uh, mask over top of the samples. And, and if you use the, the 25 millimeter diameter cover slips, you can use them in an Adafloor from Invitrogen and do live cell imaging in these structures. Of course, you have to think about the, the metals uh, if you're using those, but carbon actually worked quite well to give ni nice contrast with this approach. And this is what the image would look like by scanning electron microscopy. Wherever the heavy metal or the metals shadowed, in this case, if I use gold palladium, I would get um, a strong uh, signal back from where the letters were. And it's very easy to locate particular cells and areas. And all these little small spherical structures are the cells at low magnification. On the confocal microscope, here's an example where we were looking at the letter S. Um, I could put the confocal in reflection mode and easily see where the letter S was. Um, and then I could do the fluorescence imaging. Here, for example, you can see this is a cell with two small uh, nuclei, the bright spots inside of here, uh, and this is macrophage. And then if you go to the scanning electron microscope, you can see the same uh, area over here. Of course, when you think about it, the scanning electron microscope is a surface imaging technique. So the value of having uh, the data from the fluorescent probes and looking at internal structures and maybe uh, correlating it to something that's going ex on externally uh, could be useful for some projects. So now I want to get into a little bit into some of the strategies that I use for tissues. And um, I'm going to actually, um, I, I, I thought it would be beneficial for some of uh, you to, to get an idea of the workflow. This is actually one of the most common questions that I get for those who are interested in doing correlative microscopy. How do you process the samples to do this work? How do you get it to work uh, and get a nice image by the light microscope and then get a decent image also by the electron microscope? And to be honest with you, there's some challenges there. But I'm going to provide some strategies that will help you to, to move in the right direction. When it came to tissue, um, I'm going to use an example where we were looking at neuromuscular junctions um, in cerebral palsy patients. And the reason we decided to go to correlative microscopy was because the scientists had uh, biopsies from these patients. They're often children, and they're very precious and very rare materials. Um, these are, you know, the, the, the children are alive. They take a biopsy, and they uh, um, uh, try to do some analysis from that tissue. Um, because the materials were so precious, we wanted to make sure that we could find neuromuscular junctions efficiently um, without um, having to randomly section through EM blocks. And so we developed a technique where we would, uh, you know, uh, get the biopsy, uh, and then we would process it using a primary fixative and, and aldehyde. And then we would rinse the sample and move it into a 2.3 molar sucrose uh, uh, fixation process, and, uh, excuse me, uh, infiltration process. So we would infiltrate the samples in 2.3 molar sucrose in order to cryoprotect it to do cryosectioning, OK? Um, we would take the small piece of material and we would put it in a cryo mold and we would section it using a cryogen transfer tape system. Now this is interesting because what you do is you put a little piece of uh, um, uh, um, cryo temperature uh, um, tape that's uh, um, compatible with the cold temperatures of a cryostat on your block base. You roll it on and as you section, your um, section comes off intact on the tape. You then transfer the tape over to a glass slide and gently roll it onto the glass slide and give it a UV pulse. When you give it a UV pulse, a polymer coating on these special uh, slides will actually hold the section on for further processing. So anybody who's been working with cross sections or sections attached to slides in particular, one of the challenges is keeping that through all the washes and all the fixation without changes. And so using this crowd transfer, uh, crowd chain transfer tape system, we were able to solve that problem. Once we were done attaching the sections, we could do all of our staining that we wanted to do on the sample and then move it uh, onto the light microscope for mapping uh, and identification of the structures of interest. Um, once we did all of our light microscopy mapping and correlative work, we would then wash the sample and then do a follow-up glutaraldehyde and osmium fixation. The idea being that we kept the fixation light on the early stages so our fluorescent probes would be compatible, and then after we do it all of our light microscopy imaging, we would put the heavy metal stains, which are better for the EM side. Um, then we would take the samples um, and process them, uh, flat embed the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the section uh, on, the, um, on the slide uh, in resin, 
again, select by light microscopy, excise with a razor blade, super glue, and trim, and do our normal sectioning. This is a collaboration um, uh, with the Nemours uh, Children's Hospital in, in Delaware um, and the Bioimaging Center we're at Delaware as well. And this work is actually published. Uh, the technique is in Modla et al. in 2010 Neuro Journal of Neuroscience Methods. So let's actually show you what the data looks like. So here's an example of the low magnification imaging. This is a 6,000 by 8,000 pixel image that we tile scanned. And the area of interest in this tissue, if you look closely, you can see uh, the muscle tissue um, that was uh, in the thin slice, about 25 microns thick in this particular case. Um, and then the, the um, neuromuscular junctions were stained with a fluorescent probe called alpha bungrotoxin, which is basically snake venom, and it targets the neuromuscular junctions. So in this little red box, it's increased magnification over here, we decided that we would actually tar uh, target the, this neuromuscular junction here. And one thing that I would point, uh, um, uh, point out to you is that one of the advantages of correlative microscopy in this particular case was if you were to section randomly through this tissue just for EM in very, very thin slices, most of the tissue would actually be devoid of neuromuscular junction. So we really, even though it took a few extra steps to identify the, and uh, make this protocol work, um, we were able to very quickly focus in on the structure of interest, which is this neuromuscular junction. Now, that exact neuromuscular junction then could then be um, imaged uh, with a higher magnification using a, a water objective lens, such as a 40x apochromat, and uh, you can create a Z-stack, and then move on, and the same exact data set can then be imaged in three dimensions. So I was able to take advantage of the light microscopy to do a, a perspective of the tissue. I could then go in and um, uh, take a Z-stack of the material, and I want to point out, actually, that when you're looking at this neuromuscular junction, the field of view is actually about 50 microns uh, in size. This little curved area here is the area that we uh, went further uh, uh, and did EM analysis, which is in the next slide. This is actually a transmission EM uh, micrograph of the neuromuscular junction. All of these little uh, areas are here are called the junctional folds. That is where we expected alpha bungatoxin to uh, be deposited. And then we could overlay. And here, this is actually the one optical slice fluorescence that over, is overlaid at the same exact location. The interesting thing here, and another good point is, is that in correlative microscopy, of course, the fluorescence cannot resolve the junctional folds using conventional confocal microscopy, and we get the benefits of all of the information that the EM is providing at the same time as the light microscopy. So let's talk a little bit about strategies for fluorescent protein. So um, uh, one of the things to keep in mind uh, is that um, fluorescent proteins uh, are ubiquitous these days. A lot of molecular biology is being uh, uh, done using this approach. And so um, I was trying to find strategies that we could do correlative microscopy and either preserve the fluorescence of the correlative microscopy or otherwise be able to tag it so that we could um, look at the EM level in the same locations. So taking, uh, uh, using a similar approach that I used um, for the neuromuscular junctions, um, we were able to um, uh, uh, fix and infiltrate leaf sections uh, and be able to preserve the green fluorescent protein in this particular case, as well as uh, the chloroplast autofluorescence, and then we would calcofluor label the plant cell walls. This is a cross-section of a tobacco plant. This technique, I won't go into too much more detail today, but if you um, uh, do a quick search on biotechniques, January 2012, a detailed protocol uh, will be available that describes how we did this work. So we use this approach basically to um, uh, help solve a problem. We had a collaborator who um, was um, uh, submitting a manuscript uh, to, for review, and the reviewer came back with a criticism that we need to show that the protein that you have fused with green fluorescent protein is going to the structure that you say it is going to. In this case, the fluorescent protein uh, fusion was to a protein called PDLP5 that should locate in the plasmidosmata which are small channels uh, located between plant cells. And if you look closely in this little box, this is a cross-section of a stem. All these little bright dots are the green fluorescent protein putatively at plasminismata. If you look at the cross-section, you can see all the little fluorescent um, dots in here, which are, again, uh, supposedly are plasminismata. A little higher magnification in this area, and you can see a small smiley face uh, here, which represents a cluster of plasminismata. And then by using correlation and manual relocation, we were able to get back to the same location and see the same smiley face. If you then took uh, about seven or eight sections in a row, um, uh, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, um, I'm one slide ahead. Um, this is actually a picture at higher magnification showing the electron micrograph and the small channels uh, between the cell wall. Uh, and then here is the fluorescence overlay on top. 
Again, I would note that the resolution of the fluorescence wouldn't allow, would not allow us to distinguish individual plasmodesmata that are closely spaced together. Um, but number two, it helped to satisfy the reviewer's criticism that our localization was actually indeed going to the plasmodesmata as we expected. And if you took seven or eight slices and put them all together, you can also get a little bit more sophisticated. This is actually serial section TEM. This is the same smiley face area now put together in three dimensions. And we were able to count all the plasmodesmata in the pit field um, from the same data set, something we could not do by light microscopy alone. Another very interesting challenge, uh, an area of interest for our laboratory, was to try to preserve the fluorescent protein uh, through the resin uh, process itself. And that is possible to do. And the way that we did it in our facility, uh, and by the way, there are others who have done this using conventional approaches as well, but we actually used high-pressure frozen free-substituted samples in 0.1% urinal acetate and 0.2% glutaraldehyde in a substitution fluid of 95% acetone. The other 5% being water. So the key here in order to maintain the fluorescence through the resin process is to maintain the water uh, or the hydration shell around the fluorescent protein uh, as far into the process as possible. And then uh, after that point, we would low temperature embed at minus 20 degrees. And this is actually imaging with our confocal microscope um, at uh, a cyan fluorescent protein and a yellow fluorescent protein about 100 microns into an LR white uh, resin block. I would caution you that um, in our experience, um, it seems to be that there will be some loss of fluorescent protein signal uh, over time. There seems to be a shelf life to these blocks. Some uh, labs, I think, have been able to look at blocks um, uh, from longer periods, but uh, typically we like to look at them within a few days to a week of actually processing them. Um, at longer periods, sometimes uh, in many of our blocks, we would actually lose the fluorescent signal. To, so keep in mind if you're interested in doing this. So now I would like to spend some time on automation and workflow with Shuttle and Find. And um, I think this is uh, an interesting approach to uh, increase the productivity of correlative approaches in your facility. And it's worth spending some time. Um, here is um, the Shuttle and Find holder for life sciences, specifically for glass cover slips. And the way it works is we have a metal frame uh, on here and uh, with three fiducial marks. You can see one, two, and three. They basically come in the shape of a letter L. And on the other side, this is actually the slide where you put a cover slip in, um, is a 22 millimeter cover slip. Typically, this cover slip we would use with a metal coating. Um, uh, um, one suggestion is using indium tin, tin oxide or ITO. Um, we've used a 30 to 60 uh, ohm resistivity um, from SPI. Um, I would comment that not all ITO cover slips are created equal or all manufactured um, sub, uh, slides or cover slips with ITO uh, will have um, a, a smooth texture, so please keep that in mind when you go out and order. If you see some unusual uh, texture on the surface, it's probably um, you should find another supplier. So we would then um, put our cover slip in this holder and put it on our light microscope and um, uh, use the light microscope to find the fiducials. And once we identified the fiducials for the software, all the subsequent images uh, that were taken would actually know the location on the slide for further um, correlative imaging. So let's actually look a little bit closer of how the cover slip um, fits in. This is a very common question. Here is the cover slip holder, um, the frame. Uh, the, again, the fiducial numbers, one, two, and three. Um, we're looking at at the side where we would put the cover slip in. The cover slip fits in this little groove. And then there's a clip that comes down on top of it and slides forward and locks the cover slip in place. Of course, we don't want the cover slip to be moving during um, the steps of processing uh, or that can affect the result. Another option we have is to, uh, as a stem holder or scan, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy, where we could put a TEM uh, grid uh, inside of a holder, a 30, three millimeter grid inside of a holder and image it in stem mode to do higher resolution imaging as well. Then you can take, for example, this is our, our um, correlative cover slip holder. Um, you can put it face up uh, with a cover slip up uh, and an inverted microscope or flip it upside down so that you can use um, um, the optics from the other side. Um, for an upright microscope. And this is what you would find if uh, um, you were then going to getting uh, finished with all your light microscopy imaging. We have a special holder that allows us to take the cover slip holder or the stem holder and put it into our scanning electron microscope. So this basically is the, the holder or flange that you would use for the scanning electron microscope. I also want to point out that Zeiss is working on um, another solution. And this is using um, a high precision cover slips that actually have fiducials on here. And, and that actually is um, 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 what I'm, uh, um, uh, something that uh, I think is very useful for those uh, people who want to take the sample, do all their light microscopy imaging, remove the cover slip from the holder, 
process the sample for EM and put it back inside of the holder. The reason why you would want to do this is that um, in, in many instances fluorescent uh, probes are quenched by heavy metal um, stains and to be able to do them sequentially you can get the best of both uh, optics and light microscopy and then at the EM level. So the fiducials in a backscattered image on our scanning electron microscope will look something like this. The large letter, uh, the large L shaped or um, angled shape that you see is the one that your eye can actually see. But if you go at higher magnification, this is the marker that we would actually use to, to denote where the fiducials uh, would be uh, for much higher accuracy. At, at higher magnification, this is what the smaller fiducial looks like. So what are the advantages of using the shuttle and find? Um, well, manually, I would tell you that um, the process is very tedious. And I would estimate that one to two hours would be under, under best case scenario. Um, uh, uh, I've had a number of instances where I, would, I feel it took a good, better part of a day to carefully relocate to the, the same spot without um, um, damaging or missing the sample. Um, you can also um, uh, use the shuttle and find with and without calibration. Once you actually calibrate the holder, it only takes less than a minute for, to move from one image to the next um, within, within, um, within the, um, the program. Simply what you need to do is, is you um, uh, navigate by loading an image, clicking on the image, and then hitting an execute command, and it automatically re relocates to the area of interest. So I'm going to use an example where we use this approach for um, uh, super resolution microscopy um, with a technique called structural uh, illumination microscopy, which basically doubles the resolution of a light microscope down to about 100 nanometers, uh, plus or minus. And we decided to use platelets for this particular um, experiment. And you can imagine platelets are uh, maybe 5 to 10 uh, microns in size, actually uh, smaller than that, a couple microns in size. Um, and um, uh, when you're looking at a cover slip, it's, again, like finding a needle in a haystack. We labeled the platelets with phloidin so we could see the entire population. And particularly, we labeled certain platelets with an antibody. We were trying to identify platelets that would label with a green fluorescent antibody using uh, fluorescein. And, um, you can then uh, do your three-dimensional structured illumination microscopy. Again, the red is the phloidin, the green is my antibody to the, the surface of these platelets. You shuttle and find, move to the scanning electron microscope, and here you can see the corresponding uh, electron micrograph. If you put the two together, here is the overlay of the fluorescent labeling the rounded cells, while the phloidin is labeling all the cells, and uh, especially the ones that are spread. At a little higher magnification, you can see the platelets uh, here, um, uh, uh, again, uh, using the correlative microscopy. I would point out that the cells that were rounded were undergoing apoptosis, and because we did a serial uh, correlative technique, there was some shrinkage uh, in the cells uh, because the cells were, uh, had so much water that during critical point drying process, there was a change. However, I would argue that there's still value in knowing which cells are labeling and also looking at some details of the surface, but not trying to precisely correlate the uh, exact image in that particular case. So how did we actually do this particular correlative process? Um, well, um, we actually took the platelets and uh, put them directly onto the cover slip and allowed them attach uh, for further processing. However, there's no reason why you couldn't use the same cover slips inside of a, um, uh, um, a Petri dish with your favorite buffer, um, the media to keep the cells alive, and seed them in that way. Then uh, we would uh, take the cover slip and do um, uh, our primary um, aldehyde fixation. Typically, we would use uh, maybe 2% uh, paraformaldehyde and a small amount of glutaraldehyde just to kind of stabilize the samples, as long as your antibody or other probing method um, uh, wasn't, um, uh, didn't get interfered with. I would point out that, that there's no magical recipe here. Um, use the technique that allows you to get good probe labeling here um, for your own project. It doesn't have to be any special recipe. But we were trying to avoid autofluorescence, um, and we were also trying to um, uh, make sure that the, the fluorescent probe would work well. And so that you just keep that in mind when you're doing your own work. Um, then we would then do the antibody labeling and counter stain. So the counter stain would be oftentimes a nuclear stain, or in the case of the work uh, in the previous slide, we would label the phloidin. And then you can use your antibody approaches. Um, and then you would um, go to the light microscopy, which could be either the manual method, where we would tile large areas and then um, to make sure that we could relocate the spot. Or in shell and fine, you can go directly to the cells of interest and not worry about um, mapping the large area and then relocating later on. Of course, if you're using shell and fine, you would put the cover slip back into the holder and go to your microscope. In the case of this work, we used an Elira PS1 uh, to do the structured illumination microscopy. So one question that I commonly get is, um, light microscopy wet or dry? Well, shuttle and fine can actually use both of these approaches. 
the advantages and disadvantages need to be carefully weighed depending on the project. For um, light microscopy, um, you can imagine uh, using a dry approach where you could actually do all your fluorescent imaging and then go directly to the EM without um, uh, um, any special uh, precautions. Um, uh, they basically, um, the, uh, uh, oftentimes many fluorescent probes will become attenuated when they're dry. And the other thing to keep in mind is that lower numerical aperture obje objectives would have to be used, and therefore the resolution is lower and the sensitivity could also be lower potentially. Um, by using a water objective, you can actually keep your fluorescent uh, probes hydrated. You can do three-dimensional imaging quite nicely. Um, the, for the structured illumination microscopy, a 63X C apple chromat um, works uh, quite nicely. I have to point out that if you use any water on the sample that you need to carefully dry or remove the immersion media, or if it's oil, you need to carefully dry and remove it before moving it to the SEM or the next steps to make sure that it's clean and, and, and um, uh, taken care of. After I remove the, uh, um, any mounting media that I had on the cover slip, I would then do, uh, again, uh, e typical EM processing. I would refix in a higher concentration of glutaraldehyde, rinse move to osmium tetroxide in order to get the nice contrast and higher resolution data. And then I would do my serial um, series of solvent uh, dehydrations. Uh, typically then I would critical point dry, or you could use a chemical uh, method equivalent uh, called HMDS. Uh, then after the samples are dry, you could sputter coat, put in the holder, and then uh, find your fiducials and uh, relocate the samples. I also wanted to provide a nice example of working with thin sections. And here's a case where we did correlative super-resolution and scanning electron microscopy on thin sections, which is a common approach, um, I think, in many facilities and laboratories. One thing that you will see here is the blue. These are yeast cells, and they're about 5 microns in diameter. The blue is calcifor. Uh, um, again, using super-resolution microscopy, um, we could use calcifor to label the fungal cell wall. And here, rather than trying to keep the green fluorescent protein um, uh, uh, fluorescent through the resin, we actually just use a green fluorescent uh, antibody from ABCAM. Uh, against GFP. And when we did that, then uh, we could use an Alexa 647 secondary uh, and be able to get um, the localization of the green fluorescent protein. The thing that drove this project was that we wanted to actually find what organelle um, uh, this green fluorescent protein uh, was um, stopping in. We were trying to express it and get it all the way to the plasma membrane. It wasn't making that, that way, so by using correlative um, uh, um, fluorescence NEM, we were able to determine the structure. By the way, um, for those who are interested in super resolution, we then uh, used also uh, direct storm, which allowed us to have very high resolution imaging of the, uh, um, uh, of the uh, fluorescence uh, from the anti-GFP antibody. Again, this is the uh, structured illumination microscopy, which is probably twice as good as a, a conventional light microscope. And then uh, storm of the same exact sample in the same exact location. And then if we go to the electron microscopy at the same exact location, you see these little dark structures and bodies here and over here? We believe that they're uh, a Golgi, post-Golgi compartment, and you can overlay the fluorescence and see that there is a correlation between these structures. And so we felt that somehow this, this um, particular um, exogenous protein that's being expressed in yeast was being uh, um, uh, trapped into the Golgi uh, or some post-Golgi compartment. So how do we actually uh, do this uh, um, process? Um, so uh, in the particular case here, what we did was we did our primary fixation. And um, uh, oh, uh, well, l let me just uh, put it this way. Um, you can use any fixation method that you want to. The yeast case, we actually high pressure froze the sample. But my point here actually with this slide is, is that it can be any fixation process that you're doing to get sections now in which you're labeling uh, with a fluorescent antibody on your sections or doing other fluorescent probe labeling on sections. So this is a generic protocol. Uh, and again, for the yeast, we actually used high pressure freezing, free substitution, and 95% uh, acetone um, with um, uh, um, uh, urinal acetate and glutaraldehyde. But you could also use your standard approaches if, if, if your antibody works with primary fixation uh, in aldehydes, secondary fixation in osmium tetroxide, and block staining, graded dehydration, resin infiltration, and you can either use a beam capsule approach or um, samples on a slide, and, uh, as I've described previously. Once you have your sections, I actually pick them up in serial sections in a loop. You can use a single slotted grid. Um, if you have a lot of sections, I actually have gone down to my hardware store and gotten some um, uh, intermediate sized uh, um, O-rings, clean them up a little bit, and you can put an O-ring down and get much larger numbers of, of sections uh, onto the, um, uh, under the ITO cover slip. You dry them down. Typically, I would go about 50 degrees um, uh, overnight, but 
as long as the sections stick, uh, you don't have to go to those levels. Now, once the sections are dried for doing the counterstaining or immunofluorescence, I would actually lay them um, uh, on a piece of parafilm in a Petri dish. I would put my drop of uh, solutions, whether it's blocking buffers or fluorescent probes, um, on top of it, maybe about 50 microliters, and I would invert the cover slip down on top of it so that I can minimize the number amount of volume. At that point, once you've done all of your labeling, again, you can do manual mapping, uh, or you could go to Shuttle and Find uh, um, and do uh, just location and, and go to your microscope. In the particular case of the super resolution microscopy, I used a high NA objective. You can use an oil objective as long as you clean it thoroughly, or a water objective, depending on your system and the goal that you're trying to achieve as far as resolution. And we will just keep um, it hydrated on top of the sample. Again, remember, if you use any oil or other liquids, you need to carefully dry and remove them before processing the next steps. Once I was finished with all my light microscopy, again, I would use this parafilm approach. I would use my heavy metal lead staining and my heavy metal urinal acetate staining. Remember, these heavy metal stains typically will quench fluorescence um, unless you have high abundance of fluorescence. Um, and uh, so it's actually, um, although there's some approaches to, to kind of uh, minimize that, um, uh, if you want to use the stain technique that you've used private prior uh, for EM, I would recommend doing the sequential approach if possible. Then we would rinse, dry the sections, put them in the shallow and fine holder, and then go ahead and relocate. So now I want to take some time, uh, a few minutes, to go into um, trends in correlative microscopy, things that you might see that will be happening over the next, um, uh, uh, you know, maybe two to five years, uh, uh, and maybe longer, depending on how long it takes us to, to solve some of the issues. Number one is I think it'll be very likely you're going to see uh, improved throughput, um, and I think this is one of the re areas where Shuttle and Find excels, um, so that you can have coordinate-based cross-platform automation or in some cases where the microscopes are combined into a single unit. The other thing that we hopefully will see is improved throughput as far as automated alignment of LM and EM images. I will show a few slides in a few moments that actually show some of the challenges and ways to realign images. Think about it, uh, light microscopy is a very different magnification at the EM, EM and uh, so sometimes there are challenges in putting those images back together and aligning them. You will also see, my feeling is that super resolution as a bridge between light and EM will help drive some of the uh, correlative microscopy work where we're seeing all of the single molecule images and we want to see where they're localized at the EM level. Um, you, again, I mentioned above, you'll see integration of imaging platforms. Uh, this is on my wish, wish list to see automated block trimming um, and uh, hopefully some of the manufacturers that make those types of uh, devices will allow me just to select an area and have it automatically trim a block to save time. Certainly, you'll see new probe development. There's very strong efforts um, for genetically encoded probes. In the case of Minisog and Apex, we have a diaminobenzidine-based um, uh, um, solution where we can uh, localize both by fluorescence and at the EM level, um, depending on, uh, on how um, you, um, which approach you use. Um, and also, uh, MEOS-3 uh, is basically, I'm just talking about the MEOS, uh, using super resolution with correlative microscopy. You would expect that there will be some new enhancements there to get some better super resolution probes as well. Um, f finally, or near finally, um, correlative 3D uh, will be very, um, uh, I think, increasingly of interest using either focused ion beam microscopy. This image on the left, left is actually yeast that was uh, using focused ion beam at 5 nanometer uh, milling slice steps or step slices. The green is the nucleus, the yellow are the mitochondria, and the uh, red is the endoplasmic reticulum. And this uh, work is actually published in uh, the July issue of Biotechniques in 2012. It's not correlative work, but you can imagine that fluorescent probes overlaid onto a three-dimensional EM image will be very powerful. Things like serial block face imaging and array tomography and combining confocal and super resolution and 3D techniques will be very powerful and I think will be a trend in the future. Um, and then finally, of course, uh, Google Cell. Uh, you can envision uh, using multimodal navigation of tissue cells and organelles as we become more sophisticated with our approaches. I wanted to take a few moments to talk about automated alignment and landmark registration. Um, I started a collaboration uh, um, uh, a few years back with a group um, at UNC Chapel Hill. And uh, the idea was to use gold fiducials and have an automated alignment process. Here's an example of some macrophages that were stained with a nuclear stain um, uh, hoax. And um, you can see the nuclei here. We wanted to actually automate alignment by putting small gold particles, about 100 nanometers in size, on the surface of the, of the sample. And then uh, as we move to the electron micrograph, we can see the same cluster uh, circle of gold particles. Um, this is actually a backscattered image of the macrophages. If you invert the, the backscatter image, you'll get an image uh, like this, again, seeing the same gold particles. This mu looks mo much more like a TEM image that people are used to. 
And then within a, a, a few seconds, uh, maybe 10 seconds or so, the software is able to go ahead and look at the EM image, look at the gold fiducials, identify where they are, go to the fluorescent image, find the, the gold fiducials, and align them uh, uh, automatically. Um, alignment uh, process itself um, can take a little bit longer than that if you're doing it manually. Um, and in the cases I do it manually, I use Adobe Photoshop. This, if you want to know a little bit more about this landmark fiducial-based uh, registration, if you're using gold particles, um, this uh, presentation will be available on the link, uh, again, using the Computer Integrated Systems for Microscopy and Manipulation uh, Center at the UNC Chapel Hill. All right, so I'm going to uh, end with uh, um, some comments about getting started. So um, here are a few suggestions that I would find, uh, that you might find useful for starting or enhancing your correlative microscopy in your center. Um, first of all, if you do not already have integrated EM and LM, um, network with a nearby center, whether it's within your university or down the hall or um, some other location nearby, um, uh, pick up the phone and talk to, talk to them because I think this is a, 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 an opportunity that can help expand both of your business, particularly if you're working in a core facility, um, just by communicating, especially when you're not as familiar um, or less familiar with one of the other approaches. The second thing is, and my feeling is, correlative microscopy is best achieved with the team approach. I would say in all the examples that I showed here today, in many of the cases, um, uh, we um, had uh, people working together as a team on this. That The person who did best with the LM and the immunolabeling did one step, and the person who did um, uh, better at the EM uh, processing uh, was doing that step um, when possible. Um, and then the third thing is, even though you may have a team approach and you may do, have your own set, separate areas, uh, I think it's always valuable to share and exchange ideas and uh, complement the skills and cross-train each other in the different approaches. And I think in that way you can advance more quickly. Um, I, you know, I, today I actually showed you just a handful of techniques that we've applied um, uh, and I've applied in previous years with um, collaborators. Um, I would tell you that about 15 years ago I would do one or two correlator projects a year. Um, uh, last year, um, uh, while at Delaware, we did probably um, uh, 15, 20, 25 correlator projects. The, the amount of correlator projects was greatly increased. Um, and you have lots of options to go for. What I would say is first pick one that you want to go after. There's so many ways to do it. Um, and try to, um, uh, to, to master that first. Consider the flexibility of the scanning electron micrograph, uh, microscope as a good starting point. You can use cover slips, and they're also grid compatible, and you can use methods uh, um, looking at surfaces or sections. So there's a lots of flexibility there, and it's worth um, trying that as a good starting point. I would also suggest start simple and with low-risk projects. For example, sections are uh, much simpler to, to deal with, um, and then add complexity. If you're using a manual approach, Carefully map, uh, but be conservative. Uh, it's very easy to move too quickly between the two microscopes and lose your material. So um, uh, be conservative. And then by practicing, practice, 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 um, you will um, get more efficient and, and speed up in the process. I would also suggest identifying key projects with real correlative need. I think when you're first starting out, it might be useful to practice on a sample that's robust, but uh, ultimately you need to move over to something that will um, uh, help maybe an investigator um, that's using your facility if you're in a core facility. Um, the benefits, I, I would suggest, will become clear to other users uh, with these successful examples that you can show that you've already done in your lab. And then finally, I would mention productivity gains will make the approach more practical, affordable, and broadly acceptable, accepted within the group. If it takes too long and it becomes expensive, um, that's where some of the barriers will lie. I would suggest if you're also um, interested um, in um, combining or considering um, adding correlative, um, either LM, uh, light microscopy, to your EM facility or vice versa, um, there's an article out in April 2012 in Biotechniques, Correlative Microscopy, the Two Cultures Collide, that you might find useful reading. Finally, I'm not I'm going to go through all of these papers here, but if you have the presentation, I have a great uh, list of starting points. Uh, certainly, uh, it's not uh, all-inclusive. There are lots of great articles on correlative microscopy. But specifically, if you go to bioimaging.dbi.udel.edu slash literature, um, there's a list of 130-plus correlative publications that you can kind of peruse and find something that might be close fit to the application that you're interested in. Okay, so now we have time to uh, answer some questions. Okay, so the first question is, what is the registration accuracy using uh, shuttle and fine between light microscopy and SEM image? Okay, um, the uh, shuttle and fine product is, is um, guaranteed to be better than 25 microns uh, accuracy, um, but we find that in practice it's much better than that. Um, oftentimes I think I will be within just a couple microns. 
but occasionally uh, um, due to factors uh, such as uh, maybe the sample shifting or um, uh, slight adjustments in the stage, it can be about a field of view away if you're looking at high magnification uh, microns. So 25 microns would be the worst case scenario. Typically, maybe a field of view, maybe 50 microns, but uh, um, I think it's often uh, um, pretty accurate. Another question is, how soon will there be a Zeiss commercial instrument that can do LM and EM on the same stage? Um, I guess um, if the question is it's a combined LMEM in the same unit, um, I'm, uh, um, I guess I'm not aware at this point uh, what the plans are in, in that type of uh, situation. Um, certainly right now the, the, the most straightforward thing for us to use is um, uh, our light microscopes and using shuttle and find to interface between the two at this point. Another question that we have is, um, uh, I would like to know more about the correlation aspect, how the image recorded by fluorescence microscopy can be overlaid on the corresponding region on the EM image. Uh, I mentioned that you can use the software program uh, for if you have gold fiducials. Um, another uh, way that I use is um, going into Adobe Photoshop. You can use the transform function. In transform, it will allow you to rotate um, the image and rescale it um, uh, if necessary to overlay the two images. Um, I, there are other approaches out there as well, um, but uh, using Adobe Photoshop was one technique um, uh, that I've used um, to do that. Um, can you email a protocol for flat embedding? <laughs> okay. Um, so if you, uh, I think as long as we have your email contact information, I'll be happy to do that. I'll send you some references because there's some, um, it's a little bit older literature, uh, uh, but we can, uh, I can find some protocols for that for sure. Um, where do you get the ITO cover slips? Again, I think I mentioned that uh, different manufacturers um, uh, um, will make them. I was using SPI for the cover slips that I mentioned uh, in, in the work here. Um, you can also use other conductive approaches. You can coat them with carbon uh, as well, um, ITO cover slips. Um, I, if I recall, they're around $7 a piece, maybe $8, and you have to buy them in, in the decent sized lots. Um, so keep that in mind um, when you're uh, ordering them. If you have to save some costs, um, you can go to carbon. Uh, but the ITOs are very effective. Another question is, are there any probes that can be used with a single fixation process that are compatible with both LM and uh, EM? So um, the answer is um, it depends um, really on the project. Um, for example, um, the APEX uh, um, that I mentioned uh, it was uh, work that was done, uh, was published this fall, um, it's one of the citations. Um, they're able to, to use an ascorbate peroxidase to generate uh, a precipitate um, just by simply adding diamine and benzene uh, um, into, the, into the sample. Um, uh, again, the ascorbate peroxidase, is, uh, the APEX is being used as a fusion protein. If you also add a green fluorescent protein uh, um, in tandem uh, with the APEX, you can see the fluorescent signal, and then you can do the, um, the diamine and benzene localization and see both at the same time. Um, uh, again, uh, horseradish peroxide, diamine and benzene is, I think, probably one of the best because of the contrast you can see for diamine and benzene um, or in combination with fluorescent probes. Um, uh, I think I also mentioned um, uh, some probes, fluorescent probes, can survive through the process, um, uh, even with osmium tetroxide, um, and there's some techniques out for that. Uh, if you send me a... Um, a link directly, I can pull some of those. Uh, if you send me an email directly, uh, I can send you some, uh, some starting points there. Another question was, can you use carbon platinum coated cover slips using uh, a carbon coder? Um, I see no reason why not. Uh, if you're working with sections, as long as it makes it conductive. Um, these layers are very thin, so even when I use gold palladium or um, carbon alone, uh, as long as you don't go too thick, there is a little bit of attenuation of the fluorescent signal in the areas that are um, coded for the mask approach, for example. Um, uh, but um, uh, even with our shuttle and fine, if you decided to use carbon, car, um, carbon and platinum, it should work okay as long as your fluorescence probe isn't directly attached to the cover slip. When I think there could be some chance with the platinum, it would be quenched. Another question is, are a lot of the images shown today were from SEM. How much more difficult it is to do a correlative with TEM? So the answer is um, the, the image of the uh, um, uh, neuromuscular junction and of the uh, plant uh, um, plasminismata were both done by TEM. Uh, certainly there's some challenges there um, to do that um, uh, uh, um, when you're trying to do it in three dimensions using that approach. If, again, if you saw we, I was taking cryo sections that were 25 microns in thick, I was taking Z stacks, I would then have to go through a fair bit of processing to cut them out and get them on to, onto the grids. 
Um, definitely, it's it's more involved. Um, uh, and um, uh, and one other alternative approach would be to do serial sections and go to stem imaging, um, in which case it might be a little bit easier. Even so, you have to know that the area that you're trying to correlate is within the you know hundreds or dozens of sections that you're trying to image. So um, for sure, TEM would be a little bit more of a challenge. If you have a system that is uh, correlative and has a light microscope and EM as part of the same integrated system, then you have the issues with um, low numerical aperture lenses, less sensitivity, and um, um, uh, so on and so forth. I have another question is, um, do you have any tips to try correlative for intracellular and surface localization of nanoparticles or virus particles? Um, well, I feel pretty comfortable about the surface uh, uh, approach. Uh, if you want to do surface imaging on a scanning electron microscope, you can put it in secondary mode. Um, and doing the correlative work, um, I would, uh, in that case, I would use an approach much like um, I uh, used, described for the platelets today. One note of caution is, is that if you're trying to do um, um, antibody labeling um, uh, and you're trying to label a probe inside of the cell, uh, I would recommend avoiding the use of Triton uh, for extraction process or saponin because um, it will basically uh, um, severely alter and extract the membranes of the cells and so they won't have a nice surface view. However, if I had to see intracellular, I would probably also consider using the section approach. Again, if you can get the se sections uh, labeled and uh, put into an, um, um, uh, a low acryl type resin and you get good antigenicity, um, you can see all the inside details, um, do an antibody against the fluorescent protein. Uh, or if it's a virus and you have an antibody against the virus, you can show um, that by fluorescence as well. Uh, nanoparticles, I feel, are a little bit more straightforward. If um, they're at least 50 nanometers to 100 nanometers, you can often see them in reflection mode. Um, again, to be confirmatory, though, um, going to the EM, sometimes the nanoparticles are really well defined um, uh, and easy to, to, to spot and identify. Um, and uh, we've looked at things like titanium uh, dioxide in the past um, and you know, gold particles uh, with really good success on here. In that case, again, you, you could use reflection imaging um, uh, um, as, a, as an option. If they're organic-based nanoparticles, see if you can dope them with some fluorescent stain. Is there an opportunity for correlative for tabletop SEMs? Um, uh, I would say potentially uh, there would be. Um, uh, certainly Zeiss doesn't have a solution in that area at this, at this moment. Um, but in that case, I think it would be relying on more of the manual methods that I described today. Um, I just I couldn't tell you how the other um, if there's a solution for that commercially um, outside of Zeiss. How can we email you? Um, uh, okay, so uh, send an email to micro that's m i c r o at zeiss.com, and I will respond to you as quickly as I can. What is the optimal thickness of resin sections for SEM backscatter imaging? Um, you know, that's a, a really good question. So um, uh, it, it really depends on which instrument you're using. Uh, at Zeiss, we have different types of backscatter detectors. One of them is an energy selective backscatter detector where we can actually use very low KVs and only look at a very small region, maybe down to 5 to 10 nanometers from the surface of the section. In that case, it doesn't matter how thick your section is. The advantage would be if you had a thicker section is you would get a lot more fluorescence to see by light microscopy. One of the comments that I get from some, uh, some of users is that very thin sections under 100 nanometers, the fluorescence signal on a regular microscope is, is um, um, uh, very weak. Um, and, but using the super resolution microscope, though, the high sensitivity to see single molecules, that's less of an issue. But if you have just a standard light microscope in your facility, um, you'll have an advantage of making your sections um, a little bit thicker, uh, maybe 100 to 200 nanometers. Um, just keep in mind that um, when you're using the backscatter imaging, if you're using energy selective uh, imaging, for example, you may only be looking at a very small area at top. Uh, you can also go higher kilovoltage. Some of our tools uh, work best at 3 to 5 kilovolts. In that case, you can see the entire section uh, probably pretty easily at, at um, you know, 100, 200 nanometers with a sacrifice in resolution because you're looking at so much more information content. I hope that answers your question. And then um, the question is, can shuttle and find be installed on older models ICMs? Um, uh, actually, I would like to be able to uh, um, have you send an email to us at micro at zeiss.com and I'll tell you which uh, versions uh, it can be. So the answer is, um, it depends on which model and I, I, at the top of my head, I, I know that um, uh, um, I want to be careful um, and not give you uh, uh, an answer that uh, I'm not for sure about. And I think um, if, if we don't have any more questions, I think uh, that wraps it up for today and I really appreciate you taking the time. And again, a few, uh, the presentation will be made, made available electronically in, in a few short days and if you have more questions, 
uh, we'll email you and if you if you have a few short uh, more questions send me an email at micro at zeiss.com thank you